Good morning, everybody. Well, it's morning here anyway. I hope you like my red apron. I thought I'd look the part, being a bit of a bait chef today. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank everybody for their massive support on buying those pick and mix flavours. Um, it was an idea I only had in the last uh, month or two, and I'm amazed at the response. But what it's done is it's given everybody an opportunity to buy small amounts of flavour, give them a try without spending too much money on a bigger bottle. And it's been great because I've had lots of emails with people mixing them all together, which is exactly what uh, the whole idea was. So, you know, the, these are the little boys. Unfortunately, you guys have bought so many of them, I've run out of stock of these little bottles. So I've ordered lots, but because of COVID, they're delayed on the supply. So please bear with me. They'll be back in in a couple of weeks time, hopefully sometime after the 6th of February. Um, other things that I've been asked about is the peach flavour um, that is being made as we speak. But the laboratory, again, is on limited staff, uh, the laboratory where it's being made for me. Um, so it has been delayed and it probably won't be about for another three to four weeks, but it'll be worth waiting for. So what we're going to do today is um, I'm actually going to do a mix live on camera without any equipment just my hands but last time I had pre-made it before this time I'm going to do it actually as we are I'm going to do a half mix three eggs and I think what I will do before I start actually is I'll put these blue gloves on um, the recipe which is that I'm using today is going to be milk and honey so it's the milk and honey base mix which has got milk proteins lovely peanut meal, toasted peanut meal, uh, probiotics, yeasts, and honey-enriched bird foods. So this has a sweetening agent already in it. It doesn't need extra sweetener, and certainly sweeteners per se are something that we don't really need to worry about too much, because I don't think carp have a sweet tooth. I think we all get a bit obsessed sometimes with using too much sweetener in the bait. Uh, it should come from the base mix ingredients, and if it's a savoury mix, you can put savoury ingredients in the base mix, so you don't need to put extra salt in. Anyway, let's get back to this recipe. This is, again, a half mix, so three eggs, and I'll crack these eggs in the bowl. Um, this will be done in real time, so anybody that says, oh, I haven't got time to make my own bait, you know, I'm very busy, I've got a young family, you know, busy at work, whatever it's going to be, everybody has time to do this, I'm quite sure. Um, so we've cracked the three eggs in the bowl. I'm gonna use a double flavor blend today, which is two good springtime winter flavors. So this will be very relevant right now. Um, and the two I'm going to use is the lovely Topex and Caramel Banana blended together. Now this will work quite nicely the flavour profile of these two will work quite nicely in the milk and honey mix. So this, again, is about harmonising the flavours with the base mix. Not too many conflicting tastes and flavours, so that it will be a nice, rounded, finished boilie. So I'll take the tops off these. I'm not putting any other additives in this. No liquid foods, nothing. Just the base mix, the eggs and the flavour. And I've got two different syringes, which I can wash out with warm soapy water afterwards and clean them up, use them again. So here we go, put my glasses on. In they go. And the amount of flavour I'm going to use in this three egg mix is going to be half of one ml of caramel banana. And half of one mil of Topex. And all the milky and creamy lactones that are in that, together with a touch of caramel and that wonderful banana, which incidentally has got a little bit of eugenol in it. Um, anyone really interested in flavors may be interested to know that iso eugenol, which I've been using for 30 years, it, it goes in my butt ringer flavor. Um, that is a, a complex aroma ingredient and it's used in minute amounts to bring out certain taste characteristics of several different fruit flavours. 
So it crops up as a super ingredient quite a few times in various recipes for flavours. And the only thing I've got missing here is a fork. So William, can you just pass me that fork that's, that's there? What would I do without you? Thank you very much. So we'll just mix those briefly together. I've actually brought this plastic bowl just to do, uh, show everybody so you can see through it and see the textures. I can, I'm already getting these smells. Incidentally, just as an aside uh, to this, um, if you're using oil-based flavours, these are not oil-based flavours. So Topex, Plum, TM1, uh, Caramel Banana, they're not oil-based flavours. They are flavours based on a solvent called monopropylene glycol, which is a broad spectrum uh, solvent used in many, many confectionery flavours. And this is a confectionery recipe. Um, but if you were using an oil-based flavour like Alisalar, Chicken Tikka, ASM, roast chicken. When you mix an oil, a mixing oil or a flavour-based oil with eggs and just give it a pretty good mix round, the eggs act as a natural emulsifier. So you certainly do not need to add extra emulsifying chemicals or anything like that to your base mix, to your egg recipe, because the eggs will help to dissipate that oily flavour through the mix. I've only just remembered that, but I thought I'd say it now but we're using confectionery flavours. So this is pretty much mixed enough that it needs to be mixed. So we'll leave the fork in and put in some of this milk and honey base mix. As before, I haven't um, weighed this. I suppose I've done it that many times that I, I do tend to get a little bit used to the texture uh, of the finished bait and um, this is mixing around very nicely. What you can do if you're making a, um, a paste for example, so a paste that would be with milk and honey, uh, bio shellfish, super milk in particular which people like using as a paste, you actually don't, um, sometimes rather, it's quite difficult to um, keep that paste smooth. So what you can do with paste mixes is to use soil oil at about five mil per egg if you're making paste. And in cold water, the soil oil, when mixed with the eggs and the flavor and the base mix, will heat, keep uh, that paste soft on the hook and soft when you're out on the freezing cold lakeside or riverbank. So this is looking good. I'm gonna get my hand in here and you can see how nicely the milk and honey base mix mixes up. It's very forgiving in terms of its practicability. I think I've been probably a bit jammy there and put exactly the right amount in um, the first time round. That's a little bit softer than you would initially want, but as I've mentioned before, what often happens with these, um, or what nearly always happens with the powders, when you mix liquids with them, any liquids, it does take a while sometimes for the liquids to be fully absorbed by the powder. So some people would put this in a plastic bag, this paste, however big the ball is, and leave it for 10, 15 minutes, for the purposes of this video clip, I can't do that. So I'll put this to one side and move these over there. So this paste will switch the machine on and weigh it. Bearing in mind this is a three egg mix. This paste weighs just over 500 grams. So from, from a, um, a three egg mix, I've got 500 grams of paste. And the way that I do this quickly and easily without any rolling equipment, so it's dead easy to do, is I would take this and mix, break it up 
into about three. Let's go for three rough sort of balls. And then each one of them I would roll out and you can put a little bit of base mix on here to dust it as if you're making pastry. So here we go. It doesn't take long. And it doesn't matter, incidentally, when you're making these, which are going to be called chop-ups, it doesn't matter whether you're fishing for barbel, whether you're fishing for carp, because you don't always need perfectly round boilies. Um, if you're using a spod, you can put these chop-ups when you see them made any distance you like. You can catapult them certainly 40 or 50 yards, and you can fish with them in the margins. Furthermore, you can make different sizes and shapes from the same base mix. And of course, you've got that wonderful opportunity of um, making all different shapes and sizes, as well as different flavours with, the with these little mini flavours. And when you've worked out a good recipe and you're happy with it, then you can start making all this in bulk or getting a friendly rolling company that you trust to make it for you with the emphasis on making sure you trust them to do it for you right and you know not boil the bait too long all the rest of it so you can see what i've done i've mixed these up i've rolled them out these ones are about as thick as my finger it's really not taking very long at all here we go i shall keep doing it to the camera You know, mixes don't need to be complicated, but what they do need to be is consistent. And being consistent in the food industry is why you can see this box of Weetabix and my favourite digestive biscuits on this work surface. And this thought occurred to me, you know, when I was out walking the other day, doing my daily exercise. And I thought to myself, if it, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. The reason that Weetabix sell millions of boxes of these, and I'm not sponsored by Weetabix, by the way, is because they haven't changed the recipe. They kept it the same. Because if they did change the recipe, millions of people would know and they'd say, Weetabix isn't the same as it used to be, it's different. It doesn't taste as good. It's not got the same texture. So I'll put that over there. Digestive biscuits. They sell millions of these a day. Do you ever think that McVitie's would change the recipe of chocolate biscuits? No. They wouldn't because we so many of them we would know so it's really important that once you've found a winning recipe for example milk and honey that i'm doing today i know it works i know exactly what amount of flavor is going to be used in that mix i know how much of everything to use how many eggs how long to boil it the whole thing you can't keep chopping and changing in my view you have to get to learn one in one recipe for example, bio shellfish. That recipe has remained completely unchanged since 1993, which is when I first found out about krill, which was brought in from South America. That's when I first got hold of krill, 1993. And it's been in bio shellfish mix ever since. The recipe has remained unchanged, as indeed this recipe has remained unchanged. So we'll do this last ball whilst I'm wittering on, and um, finish this off, rolling it out, break that in half again, and you can see that it's not sticking to the work surface, it's dead easy to use. If you've got a rolling machine, or one of those nice gardener rolling tables, you know, the flatbed ones, or a shillam, either one of those two, this will roll beautifully through, if you do it in bulk, you might need a little bit of inert oil, soy oil is the best one, 
that's good organic soil oil. That will work well as a mixing oil and it helps it go through the big extruder guns if you're using that. A lot of bait companies do that, they put a little bit of mixing oil to help it go through the rollers fast. So here we go. I've done all these. Give that one a bit more of a roll. So we're going to leave these for a minute or two and I'm going to put some water on to boil. People have asked me how long do you boil bait for? Um, obviously there's a different preparation process to making hook baits than there is to making free offerings. These would be free offerings. I've already gone over a little bit doing hook baits, which I will do again with different mixes. But what we will do is we will just get some water on the boil, as I said earlier on. We'll move the, the boiling ring up onto the surface and we'll do that very safely because it's a gas ring and I'm doing it indoors. So I'll open the window here. And when I see you in a few minutes time, we'll be boiling and we'll talk about a few more things so what I'll do is, I'll see you later. So I've got the uh, big boiling ring on here. This is a proper boiling ring. Um, obviously I've opened the windows. I wouldn't normally do this unless I had very good ventilation and I frequently do it outside. So this is a, quite a big saucepan and it's important that you have the biggest saucepan you can get. The one I use for bulk boilers would be about four times this size, 30 litres and this would be turned up full. So we have a, a rolling boil in here. The water's really boiling hard, as if you're making pasta. And I'm gonna turn it up even more when I put the chop ups that I've done here in there. So you can see here, I've chopped a few up just whilst the water was boiling. And I'm going to, I've done a, a little thin one here because that gives me lots of options. Nice sharp knife and a work surface that won't spoil. We'll chop these up, finish chopping, just ever so quick this is, finish chopping these up and it makes you feel really good when you do this because you feel that you're doing something yourself and that you, you are in control, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling and when it rips off in the middle of the night on one of these that you've made, you're fishing. Okay, so that's pretty much done. So, the saucepan you can buy anywhere online, just get a big old saucepan. These wire baskets, I think I got this from Robert Dias or any good ironmonger. So obviously it fits perfectly. And we'll just put these into the wire basket. Just bearing in mind this is a three egg mix and I would say that in a saucepan of about this size which is about 10 inches across a three egg mix in one go is about the maximum you could get away with without it going off the boil and you don't really want it to go off the boil you want to keep these cooking away so they don't stew they've got to be cooked quickly but not stewed. So I'm going to turn this up and it might be a bit noisy. Here we go. The water is still boiling, albeit not quite as strongly as it was before. I'm Agitating the, the cooking basket, the wire basket, just to stop them sticking together. There we go. just turn that down a little bit because 
they're boiling very well. I haven't timed this because I roughly know when they're ready. And one of the reasons that I know they're ready is because as soon as they start to pop up to the surface, it means they're pretty much cooked, which is about one minute for these chop ups. I generally then give them about 10 more seconds because these are quite big baits and they'll be done. So switch it off, they're cooked. They're all floating on the surface. So wonderful. A nice tray of amazingly nice smelling chop ups. Enough for a session, whether you're carp fishing, whether you're barbel fishing. Don't touch that, John, it's hot. <laughs> um, well, that's how, quick it, that's how quick it is to do. And whilst the first clip had quite a lot of detail in it, it sets the scene for what we are now going to do, which is to go fishing. So what I'm going to do is just have a short pause for a second whilst we let these dry off. So we're still going to keep to the same clip, but we'll switch the cameras off for a second just whilst I remove this uh, steaming cauldron of water. See you in a minute. OK, so we've got rid of that uh, hot steaming saucepan of water. Um, these are cooling. We've, we've done it in real time, so the whole thing has taken probably 15 minutes from start to finish, maybe a little bit longer. OK, if you were to allow half an hour, you would certainly be able to do this in half an hour. And it doesn't take much longer to do, you know, a six egg mix, just making chop ups. So one of the most important things about uh, the, the finished bait, in my opinion, is the taste. And I've even got a base mix called Taste, which we'll cover perhaps in the next clip with some savoury flavours. But there's one thing that, that all us old, old guys do, all us uh, old school guys do, or certainly did in uh, the 70s and 80s when we made our baits, was when your mate had made a bait and he said, oh, I've got this new bait I've made at home because you couldn't buy a bait then. You had to make your own bait. There were no commercial baits. So he'd open up the bag and he'd show you one of his baits or his paste, or whatever it was. And the first thing you did was to get one of them and eat it. This is absolutely delicious. It's not too strong. I can taste the base mix. I can taste both the flavours, a little bit of banana. It certainly tastes a bit like Werther's Sweets, a bit toffee caramelly. That's in there. It's got some texture to it because of the seeds and the bird foods that are in the base mix. It actually tastes really delicious. And also coming through is that creamy, buttery, lactone Topex. And I'm doing this live to camera. I'm not doing it for effect. I'm doing it because it really matters. But I've just eaten that and swallowed it. That is how confident I am in these recipes, in my bait, in my recipes, and the whole concept of making proper materials, using proper materials and proper carp baits. Um, somebody brought a bait to a lake I was fishing recently, for example, and they said, oh, I've got this new bait. And I said, oh, uh, can I taste it? And he said, well, if you really want to, it tastes disgusting. Anyway, I tasted this bait, and it was the worst tasting bait I had ever tasted in 50 years. It was so full of spices, peppers, I don't, God knows what was in it. 
he'd had it made by a bait company. Um, I can't remember which one, doesn't matter which one. Um, poor chap, didn't get a chance to go fishing very much, had a young family, and I didn't know what to say to him really. But I ended up telling him the truth. And I just said, you, you can't be using this. It's absolutely horrendous. It, it tastes foul. Fish will not come to this bait. Anyway, I went home, got some of my own bait that I used for myself and gave it to him. And uh, well, he was very happy about that and he caught the fish, so that's fine. But we won't go on about that because it was it's just the taste thing really. So these chop ups, that are in here. Milk and honey, caramel banana and topics blended together to three eggs, just half a mil of each. And in fact, when we stopped the camera, my son William, who's behind the camera, he tasted one as well. And he said, do you know, I'm really surprised. It tastes really good. Well, I love that, it's brilliant. So, where do we take all this? Where we take it all is, as I said in the last clip, we will continue covering these points and we'll continue covering the importance of getting the bait tasting right. I will also go on to stepping up the production of bait by using round boilies. And just behind me, I've got a table system set up with an extruder gun and we'll be running that on video clips so people that have got a small setup at home with flatbed tables and a, either a handgun or a pneumatic extruder gun, that's what I use for my own bait. And I'll show you how I do it my way on that. I hope you have enjoyed this. I have. Um, I thoroughly enjoy doing these clips. And whilst they seem to have an awful lot of information coming through to them, I have had lots of emails from people saying that they want more and more detail. Whilst I'm happy to give everybody more and more detail, I think that has to be relevant to the average guy perhaps that hasn't done this sort of thing before, um, doesn't have the equipment. And I think to get back in to the bait making thing, particularly when we've all got a lot more time now during this horrible lockdown period and in the future, what I think we should try and do is utilise our time as best as we possibly can to understand and grasp the concept of proper bait, fresh bait in particular. We should think about not using bright dyes, all of which taste funny, so you have to put extra things in the bait to counteract the taste of those dyes. We shouldn't be using preserved bait if we can avoid it. Fish don't like it, they will eat it, but I'm not quite sure what all those preservatives do to their systems. Certainly, I'm a fishery owner. I don't like people using preserved baits, my members. So for 18 years, preserved baits have been banned. Some indeed of halibut pellets because of their horrible high oil content. 45% oil content halibut pellets have. Um, and other things which which I suppose, you know, this sounds a little bit of a, a sort of a down note on what is otherwise an upbeat uh, clip. But I think we really should be very careful about using um, inorganic materials in our bait or things that we don't fully understand, such as DMPT. Um, not happy about that material being used in bait. It's supposed to only be used in hook baits and you certainly can't use it in a boilie because it's not uh, stable when heated. Um, and just to finish off, I've had a huge response from people in general about this nonsense that's going on about using these old fashioned flavours. Um, when I say old fashioned, yeah, I mean old fashioned. They are old technology flavours. Some of them are 10, 15 years old, being sold on the internet, um, it's a con. Um, some of these, I'm quite sure, are actually potentially even counterfeit. Don't buy them. It's not worth all your time on the bank 
the hundreds of hours that we spend as anglers fishing on the bank, for the Lord's sake, use fresh bait, fresh ingredients, and don't be hoodwinked into buying stuff off the internet where you don't know where it's come from, what's in it, or more to the point, how the contents of that bottle of flavour will have reacted with the vessel that it's contained in. So I will leave you with that thought and I'm going to look forward to putting these in my freezer and I'm going to go fishing with these. So thank you all very much. Um, I would like all those people that have been following me to continue to uh, comment and subscribe and uh, share all this information so that other people can perhaps learn a bit too. And I'll catch you next time where we will be covering taste base mix, alisalar, chicken tikka, roast chicken, and all those lovely savoury flavours as we begin to come into the springtime and the summer. See you later. Bye.